Now that we're in the same country, shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you, or even for you, this day in the city of David, the Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. And bless the Lord indeed. We've been talking about... Um, the divine initiative, the divine identity, and also the divine intention. And it is the intention of God in this narrative, as is clearly stated, that in bringing his son into the world, it is his intention to save without limitation. That the manger scene declares for us the boundless grace of God the mercy of God unfettered as it were the grace of God multiplied and poured out before the world and I would, I would suggest to you that his grace is poured out to the world in a non in, in fact I would call it the most glorious non-threatening way. Sometimes, you, you know, we can help people and, 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 and our help sometimes comes with a, a warning or this is the last time I'm going to do this. It's, well, God's grace is not doled out it's it's just dumped it's poured it's multiplied in a non-threatening fashion just the, the concept of, of this whole idea of of redemption the the plan of God which includes obviously the birth of his precious son Jesus into this world what a, what a method what a method in fact there's a song that's um, one of the, the statements comes from the song and I can't remember the name of the song nor who sings it but in the song the, they say this is such a strange way to save the world strange to save the world God is born as a baby to a poor family, poor, lowly family, despised. The poor are despised. They're looked down upon. But what did God do? God being born as a baby came to a poor family, placed value on the poor, ignored by the world, but not by God. And in doing so, he, coming to this world, he set aside his Isaiah calls it the train that filled the temple in Isaiah 6 and traded the train that fills the temple for swaddling cloths. It's, it's just an amazing story at every level. And his entrance into the world, however, sublime, sublime and um, in, in a way... With, without a lot of fanfare, earthly fanfare. In fact, no earthly fanfare. 
But there was a heavenly announcement from the angel. And he just appeared without warning. And then thousands upon thousands, in fact, the scripture says, a heavenly army came and also announced to the shepherds, the lowly shepherds, the entrance of God into this world as a baby. And why? This last point, one of the last points in my, my outline is the divine intention. He came not to give us a holiday, <laughs> um, a winter holiday, but rather he came to save, and that without limitation. He calls this in chapter 2, Luke chapter 2, verse 11 Verse 10 and 11, the angel said to them, don't be afraid for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people, singular, all people, everyone, without classification, without distinction, everyone. This news is for everyone. And without limitation. And the reason why there's uh, good news and great joy. What is the good news and the great joy? Verse 11 tells us. For there is born to you this day in the city of David. The Savior. Who is Christ the Lord. And again the, the uh, subject that we've been dealing with over these uh, past few weeks has been good news. There is hope for the world. Our world is in desperate, desperate need of good news. And it just doesn't stop. The bad news just keeps rolling in. It doesn't stop. And When, when bad things happen, in fact, a uh, great, I shouldn't say a great, but a, a nice book written, at least in terms of his, his purpose, um, Rabbi, um, I forgot his name now, uh, Rabbi, it will come to me, but uh, he, he wrote in his, in his book, um, when good things happen, rather when bad things happen to good people, and, and he's trying to explain from, from his understanding why that is, why evil, bad things happen to good people. And I, I want to invite you, if you will, as we gaze, as we attempt to gaze once again upon the manger, I want to set for you this idea, I want to suggest to you that when we gaze in and upon the manger scene. I believe we're confronted with, with so many things. But one of the things I, I believe we're confronted with is the nature and, and even the problem, I would suggest, of evil. When, when we look at the, the manger scene, when you, when you see the baby in the manger. One of the things that God wants us to see in this event of God coming to this earth, born as a baby, he wants us to be confronted by the evil, suffering, and pain that's in the world. How did it get here? Well, obviously, he came because of sin. Sin is the problem. Sin is the origin of evil, suffering, and pain. And when we look at the manger, think of what we're, what we're seeing. We're seeing God's solution, hope for the world, God's solution 
to evil, suffering, and pain. And what is God's solution? A baby born in a manger. Somebody connect the dots for me. Well, God does. He connects the dots. He makes sense of the baby born in a manger. And clearly we know in the New Testament that the baby born is God incarnate who came not to, to, um, to live, but to die. He came to live so that he could die. Let's put it that way. So living as a human wasn't his ultimate goal. His ultimate goal was to die as a human sacrifice. But he had to come. He entered the world. And, and here, here's the twist here in, in, in my thinking. Um, God, omnipotent, can do anything. Omnipresent, all knowledge, knows everything. Knows everything in reality and knows everything as a potentiality. What does happen and what could? God knows it all. Amazing, amazing. And can do anything. There's nothing, nothing he can't do. And, and, and yet he chose. He could have come. In fact, like in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, he showed up as the angel of the Lord. Fully, fully um, enshrined in, in a... In a human body, but identified as the angel or the messenger of the Lord. So he, he took on bodily form before. That's clear in the Old Testament on several occasions with, with several of the Old Testament patriarchs. He showed up in their, in their existence, in their life, in their experience. But in the New Testament, he doesn't come as a fully grown man comes as a baby. God's solution, our hope for the world, is a baby born in a manger. How do, how do we reconcile, though, this idea of, of God who is good, all-powerful, all-knowing, can do what he wants. But how do we reconcile if God is good? And this is often how, how the question is asked. And let, let me pose it this way. When, when storms come, calamity of some sort, and wipes out hundreds, thousands of people, the tsunamis that took thousands of people out of this world into, into eternity, just wash them right out into the ocean, and, and the souls were ushered into eternity. Thousands. Bodies weren't found. Or Sandy, the, uh, the, the devastation of, of the hurricanes. How, how do we reconcile? How do we um, put, put, a, put this puzzle together? You, you, you've ever, uh, sure, you've put puzzles together. Um, wh what do you do when, when, you, when you buy a puzzle and here you are, you want to work on a puzzle and, and there may maybe thousand pieces or more what do you do? <laughs> yeah, 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 it's right, that's right. So, so that's right. That's good. And, and now, before you work on, on the, the frame, that outside, what do you do? You got to look at the picture. Where are we going with this, right? You, you need to know where and what this thing is going to look like. You study that. So that when those different pieces show up, you, you got an idea about where, where they'll fit. Well, this, this idea of God being good, great, and yet evil exists. Connect that for me, please. <laughs> I mean, let's, let's, let's see if we can put those puzzle pieces together. How, how does evil exist? If God is good, that's, that's the, I, the, in fact, I, as I was uh, preparing, many, many um, 
um, complains, complaints about Christianity is, is that our, our understanding of, of reality is, is somewhat of a, a conundrum, uh, contradictory in the sense that we proclaim a good God, but there's so much evil. And, and a lot of people reject this notion that uh, God exists. They, they take what they believe is the easy way out. They look at evil. Oh, it's there. And, and, and they take the easy way out. In fact, uh, one, one uh, book I was reading um, by um, a gentleman by the name of, of uh, Dr. Uh, Norm Geisler, Great, great book. Um, in, in, his, in the title is called "If God, Why Evil?" And I, I mean, once again, he this this book um, he he deals with this issue of evil in the world. If God exists, how can evil be? This writer, um, Rabbi, Rabbi Kushner, um, he dealt with it: pain and suffering. C.S. Lewis, in his book, um, he calls it the problem of pain. See, pain and suffering, if you, if you and I are going to be realistic about real, this, this thing, the reality of pain and suffering, we've got to confront it. And, and not sugarcoat it, but, but deal. And I, I believe that's one of the things we, we are confronted with, with, with God in the manger. The good guy who becomes a baby. One, one of the, uh, the arguments is, is this, um, in, in um, Dr. Norman Geisler's book, he says this, that uh, there are three views about evil, three different views in, in his book called um, If God, Why Evil? And in his, in his writing here, he, he says this, that there are three different views as to how we deal with evil. One is what's called pantheism. Pantheism is this notion that God is everything, and everything is God. The rock is God, the wood is God, the paper, the microphone, the chair, the sky, the bird, yeah, you, the water, the stones, everything is God. And, and in fact, Mary Baker Eddy um, in, in her philosophy and her understanding of, of um, what, what she calls her, her religion, this idea of, of Christian science and, and the, their study, what they conclude as pantheist, they believe that there's no such thing as evil. Because of pantheism, pantheism says there is a God, but evil doesn't really exist. It's just an illusion. You, you, just, you just don't understand what that is. And we call it suffering and pain and evil. See, that, that's how they deal with it. They try to work their way through it by accepting the reality that God is everything and that evil doesn't exist. Only in the, the, the mind do we create this idea. Then, then the atheists, in, in their thinking, they affirm evil. That evil is real, and therefore, God can't be real. That, that's how atheists approach it. They, they, make the, the, they make evil omnipotent and great and powerful and deny God exists. And then there's your circles, our circles that we try. We're called, we're called theists. As theists, we affirm that God is and that evil exists. We, we understand that one, um, that God is, and that as good and great as he is, yet at the same time, uh, we, we do understand that there is real evil. And it's not imagined. I'm not imagining. You don't imagine pain when it happens. When, when a loved one dies and you feel your heart just, just quake with, with sorrow, that's not an imagined feeling. That's real. And, and, and so I, I believe the manger, the manger is God's way of, of confronting evil. 
getting us to look at it, look at, look at it, by, by way of, of the manger, look at evil. Look at it. Look, look at what it's done. What has it done? It, it required God to come from heaven, step down um, um, two stages to get to the poverty, the, the, the depravity of human nature. See, the Bible, the Bible says that uh, man is a little lower than the angels. <laughs> so God, who made the angels, is above the angels. So in order to get to mankind, he skipped over angelic nature and came down to the, the hood. <laughs> <laughs> came down to the hood and took on hoodness, humanity, walked in human hood flesh. He, he wants us to confront it. Look at, look at it. it. It required, see, God, God is solution oriented. He, he is solution oriented. So when, when we're talking about God's uh, hope for the world and confronting evil, it's about a solution. The solution is not a philosophy. It's, it's not um, a theory. It's not a movement. It's not a religion. The, the solution is none of the above. The solution is not government. It's not the White House. It's not Congress. I, let me say this. All of that I just shared is the problem. That's, that's part of the problem, because that's us. We come up with philosophies, we come up with theories, we come up with movements, we come up with religion, we come up with government. We're the problem, folks. And what, what's going on inside of us is the problem. God has a solution. And, and see, the solution, if, if, if we're the problem, guess what can't happen? Will never happen. If we are the problem, we can't, we can't solve it. You've, you've got to see that. You, you have to be confronted with this reality that you can't fix what's wrong with you. I can't fix what's wrong with me. The world can't fix what's wrong with it. No, no amount of plans and, 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 and talking and meetings and, and nego it, it won't happen. The, the, the deeper, the more, the, more, the more we try to fix it, the messier it gets. We've had human history now for about 6,000 years. And, and some in their theory think we're getting better. No, there's no way. It's, the, the word of God is right. The, the more wiser we get, the more wicked we get. Now, now, in order to do that, in, in order to say that, you know what's required? In order for me to say that there is such a thing as wickedness, evil, pain, suffering, in order to have um, the ability to discern and to classify one thing as evil and another as good, in order to have evil, if, if there is evil, there must be good. You cannot have evil without good. And, and so the, the whole idea is that God wants us to be confronted with evil, but look in the face of, of the goodness of God in the manger and see. See this, this, this idea of what God says this is, is the indeed the solution you and I are not it we're the problem and so we complicate life for ourselves we make it what it is by our nature by who we are it is God's intention to save us without limitation but you know what we, we can't be saved if, if we're not confronting our lostness. That's, that's what the manger is all about, to confront us with our lostness. 
And, and so the idea of the babe in the manger really is given to help us to understand the depravity of our souls. And, and it demonstrates in, in a powerful way just how utterly depraved and helpless we are. God saves and he uses base things to bring him glory. Base, small. The unexpected places. Bethlehem. Babe in a manger, in a horse trough, or in a feeding trough for animals, out in a barn. I mean, <laughs> amazing, amazing truth. It demonstrates, again, our utter depravity and our helplessness. Um, the wretchedness of our, of our souls, we, we won't see that. We, we'll never see it if we really don't look hard and long at the manger and the cross. Both are our bookends. And we'll never fully appreciate the Savior born as a baby and the Savior dying on a cross until we're confronted with our own depravity. We won't fully appreciate the manger without our understanding just how bad and wretched our souls are, apart from the intervention of God. And, and I would suggest that the, the, um, the gospel, the manger, and those who fail to see how wretched they are and their sinful depravity, the manger is lost on them. They, they just don't and will not get it. I want you to get it. I, I want us to really, and I don't know that we'll fully in this life get it. Part of our depravity um, is, is, is our mind. Our, our will, our, our thinking, our heart. We're, we're, we're infected bad in a, in, a, in a bad way. I mean, if, if we were to talk about depravity as a, um, as a physical disease, it would be comparable to um, Cancer that's metastasized, that's just spread throughout every organ of the body. That's, that's where we are spiritually, if, apart from God intervening in the manger. If we're, we're, we're thoroughly, thoroughly infected by the sin nature. And God has a solution. He has confronted it head on. And he wants to deal with it. Deal with what? Deal with our depravity. He wants us to see it. The heart. And, and there, there are some, some terms that are used in the New Testament. For instance, in the, um, in the, in the scripture, uh, the, the Bible speaks about the heart. Um, and the heart is the whole mental faculty or the moral activity. The seat of our moral nature. The place where we where we uh, see either good or evil, where we can know things. It's, it's, it's the, mo the mental and the moral working together. So when we see danger, the mind works in hand with the moral. This is not, you see a bus coming, the mind works with the, the moral activity. You see danger coming, so the, the mind working with the moral activity and, and causing you to make a decision, your will. You decide, you know what, I need to get out of the street. The bus is going to run me over. See, it, it starts with the mind and the heart. The mind is this place where we reason 
and, and perceive things and understand things. And, and our reasoning is affected. Our perception of reality is affected. Listen, listen to this text here in, in uh, uh, man, I've got so many up here. But, but let, let me start with, look, look at Ephesians chapter 4. The, the mind, the will, and the heart um, is affected deeply by sin. Why did God come? As a solution. What's wrong with the world? Sin and its depravity. Look at what um, Ephesians says. Paul says here in Ephesians chapter 4, and I'm going to start reading at verse 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind. See, their mind in their thinking and their reasoning, it is futile. It is, it's a waste of time. Now, this, this is so interesting. He, he just classifies every lost Gentile who is not saved, obviously. In their mind, he's saying that their thinking and their reasoning, their understanding and their perception of reality is futile. I just think that's, that's just such a broad, sweeping uh, statement. And we're, we're talking about men who have aspired toward um, um, pro, um, professions. We're talking about doctors and lawyers. We're, we're talking about from uh, the, the, the professions, but we're also talking about every, every, hum, every human being. Futile minds, thinking and reasoning. What's wrong with our world? Futility of our minds. Empty. Empty reasoning. Why? Because it, 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 it's, not, it's not healed. It's, it's not fixed. And so our, our thinking, as, as lost people, we, we come up with ideas that are affected, that are sin-tainted, tainted by sin. Verse 18 says, having their understanding darkened their understanding of life and their perception, their reasoning is, is in darkness. Alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. That's, that's what, what we are without Jesus Christ. The heart, the mind, the will, it's all affected. And so God has a solution for our depravity. See, depravity is, is this idea that um, every aspect of, of our nature, our being, our thinking, our mind, our will, our, our, this idea of the will is our choices, what we decide to do. The entirety of our being, Paul says, in fact, in Ephesians chapter 4, he says, because of our fallenness, we were by nature children of wrath chapter 2 and he says we were dead in our sin and trespasses we're, we're uh, the, the depravity of, of the human soul apart from God is called dead there, there is no life there, there is no ability there is no ability toward righteousness to do something good. In fact, let, let me give you this, this quote. Um, Martin Luther, in his book called The Bondage of the Will, uh, states that the depravity of man by his fallen nature or his fallen state is wholly and entirely lost without the ability of his will toward any spiritual good accompanying salvation. Meaning this, that mm -hmm. Being lost, being lost. See, that's an example. <laughs> we, we, thanks for that, that uh, great illustration. Just comes out of nowhere. Sin doesn't need, a, need, need a, a reason. It just shows up. 
but, but it, it's without the ability of the will to any spiritual good that, that we as lost people are incapable of pursuing God without divine intervention. So when you look at lost people in the city, they're not only in the city. <laughs> they're in the county, suburbs, country. See, sin knows no bounds. Because where people are, sin is. When you see lost people, know this, that they are bound. They're in bondage in their will. You can talk to them. You can reason with them. You can show them. You can say, you're going to die without God, without Christ. And, and they'll re respectfully either disagree or say, yeah, I know, but, you know, whatever, and, and go on. And, and you wonder, don't you get? No, no, they don't. Why? Because they're in bondage to their will. Their mind, their, or, or, their thinking is futile. Their heart is blinded. And then unless God intervenes, in fact, that's, that's what Paul argues in Ephesians 2. And you who were dead in sins and trespasses, he quickened and made alive. For by what? Grace are you saved. That not of yourselves is a what? Gift of God. Without the intervention of God, without the babe in the manger. We're lost. We're lost. We're, we're bound in our will. But hallelujah, he set, he set me free. Set me free from the bondage of the will and now has freed me with the ability to say no to sin and yes to God. Whereas before, before salvation, before the new birth, oh, I could never choose God. Didn't want him. Didn't care. And such, as, such it is with, with all lost people. They don't care. They don't give a hoot about God. They don't understand. They don't see. They don't have the heart quickened to know. And so when they look at the manger, it's a pretty scene. Um, a baby in a, in a, in a manger. And, and they, they, they just kind of go on with life. It's, it's a holiday. It's a nice gesture. It's a very nice gesture. And, and it's a gesture to show us how we, how we uh, need to really love each other around this time of year. That's what Christmas is all about. They, they miss they miss. The real message, the real message is that uh, God has a solution for our depravity. I, I want to take a uh, turn here. Um, over the next couple of weeks, we're, we're looking at this idea of, of um, the rescue of the lost. We're looking at this idea. God rescues. He came to rescue us. We were lost. We were incapable of obeying the gospel until God rescued us. He intervened. And God help you to dispense with the thinking that uh, you decided to follow Jesus. You, you and I, let, let me give you a representation, a picture of, of what it looks like to be lost. A, a classic, a classic illustration is Lazarus in the tomb. That was us. We were wrapped in, in burial cloth. In, in, in sconced inside a tomb with a rock over it. Dead, lifeless. Lazarus was dead four days, and he would he would he would have stayed in that in that in that cave in that tomb until the he who is life spoke, and he called Lazarus. He said, "Lazarus, get up." 
It was only then that Lazarus was able to come out of his bondage. I see myself in Lazarus' tomb prior to Jesus. I didn't want him. I was wrapped in my own sinfulness. But one day I heard the voice of the risen Savior say, David, come out. And, and, and what's amazing, what's amazing, this is, this is, this is, this is God. Jesus comes to the, to the tomb. And he says, where have you laid him? They took him to the tomb. And, and the Bible says that there was a stone roll over. And they warned Jesus, well, he's been dead four days. You don't want to open that. Jesus said to them, move the stone. Basically what he's telling them, you do what you can do to help Lazarus. See, now, now let, me, let me put some flesh on this. See, it, it, we, we want people saved. We, we want them to come to Christ. They're depraved in their mind and their thinking. And what we want to do, we, we need to do what, what we can do. See, God gives us as believers the ability to move stones. See, because God wants us to do what we can do, and you leave the stuff that he does to him. Only God can raise the dead. Look, stop frustrating yourself. Stop trying to fix people. You and I can't fix them. You and I cannot save. We have no ability. If God is not calling them, they're dead. What we do? Move stones. What God does, raise the dead. That's what he did in my life. He raised, he raised me, he raised me, he spoke. He did that in your life.